War Horse by Michael Morpurgo. First published, Great Britain, 1982. Edgemont, UK Limited. Chapter 13. So Topthorn came into that spring, weakened severely by his illness, and still with a husky cough, but he had survived. We had both survived. There was hard ground to go on now, and the grass grew once more in the fields, so that our bodies began to fill out again, and our coats lost their winter raggedness and shone in the sun. The sun shone too on the soldiers, whose uniforms of grey and red stayed cleaner. They shaved more often now, and they began as they always did every spring to talk of the end of the war, and about home, and about how the next attack would finish it, and how they would see their families again soon. They were happier, and so they treated us that much better. The rations improved too with the weather, and our gun team stepped out with a new enthusiasm and purpose. The sores disappeared from our legs, and we had full bellies each day, all the grass we could eat, and oats in plenty. The two little halflingers puffed and snorted behind us, and they shamed Topthorn and me into a gallop, something we had not been able to achieve all winter, no matter how hard our riders tried to whip us on. Our newfound health and the optimism of the singing, whistling soldiers brought us to a fresh sense of exhilaration as we rolled our guns along the pitted roads and into position. But there were to be no battles for us that summer. There was always sporadic firing and shelling, but the army seemed content to growl at each other and threaten without ever coming to grips. Further away, of course, we heard the renewed fury of the spring offensive up and down the line, but we were not needed to move our guns and spent that summer in comparative peace, some way behind the lines. Idleness, even boredom, set in as we grazed the lush buttercup meadows, and we even became fat for the first time since we came to war. Perhaps it was because we became too fat that Topthorn and I were chosen to pull the ammunition cart from the railhead some miles away up the artillery lines, and so we found ourselves under the command of the kind old soldier who had been so good to us all winter. Everyone called him Mad Old Friedrich. He was thought to be mad because he talked continuously to himself, and even when he was not talking, he was laughing and chortling at some private joke that he never shared with anyone. Mad Old Friedrich was the old soldier they set to work on tasks no one else wanted to do, because he was always obliging and everyone knew it. In the heat and the dust, it was tedious and strenuous work that quickly took off our excess weight and began to sap our strength once more. The cart was always too heavy for us to pull, because they insisted at the railhead on filling it up with as many shells as possible, in spite of Friedrich's protestations. They simply laughed at him, ignored him, and piled on more shells. On the way back to the artillery lines, Friedrich would always walk up the hills, leading us slowly, for he knew how heavy the wagon must have been. We stopped often for rests and for water, and he made quite sure that we had more food than the other horses who were resting all that summer. We came to look forward now to each morning when Friedrich would come to fetch us from the field, put on our harness, and we would leave the noise and the bustle of the camp behind us. We soon discovered that Friedrich was not in the slightest bit mad, but simply a kind and gentle man whose whole nature cried out against fighting a war. He confessed to us as we plodded along the road to the railhead that he longed only to be back in his butcher's shop in Schleiden, and that he talked to himself because he felt that he was the only one who understood himself or would even listen to what he was saying. He laughed to himself, he said, because if he did not laugh... He would cry. I tell you, my friends, he said one day, I tell you that I am the only sane man in the regiment. It's the others that are mad, but they don't know it. They fight a war, and they don't know what for. Isn't that crazy? How can one man kill another and not really know the reason why he does it? Except that the other man wears a different colored uniform and speaks a different language. And it's me they call mad. You two are the only rational creatures I've met in this blighted war, and like me, the only reason you're here is because you are brought here. If I had the courage, and I haven't, we'd take off down this road and never come back. But then they'd shoot me, when they caught me, and my wife, and my children, and my mother, and my father would have the shame of it on them forever. And it is 
I'm going to live out this for mad old Friedrich, so that I can return again to Schleiden and become Butcher Friedrich, that everyone knew and respected before all this mess began. As the weeks passed, it became apparent that Friedrich took a particular liking to Topform. Knowing he had been ill, he took more time and care over him, attending to the slightest sore before it could develop and make life uncomfortable for Topform. He was kind to me as well, but I think he never had the same affection for me. It was noticeable that he would often stand back and simply gaze at Topthorn with love and glowing admiration in his eyes. There seemed to be an empathy between them, that of one old soldier to another. The summer passed slowly into autumn, and it became clear that our time with Friedrich was coming to an end. Such was Friedrich's attachment to Topthorn by now that he volunteered to ride him out on the gun team exercises that were to precede the autumn campaign. Of course, all the gunners laughed at the suggestion, but they were always short of good horsemen, and no one denied that he was that. And so we found ourselves the leading pair once again, with mad old Friedrich riding up on Topthorn. We had found at last a true friend, and one we would trust implicitly. If I have to die out here away from my home, Friedrich confided in Topthorn one day, I would rather die alongside you, but I'll do my best to see to it that we all get through and back home. That much I promise you. <laughs>